it's an honor being in this beautiful church of the Nazarene. I was raised in a little Presbyterian church in West Virginia, and God called me to preach at a young age. And so at 15 years of age, I preached my very first sermon uh, in a church of the Nazarene. And right when I got up in the pulpit to preach, a little lady stood up and said real loud, praise the Lord, and I forgot everything I was going to say after that. <laughs> I want to read uh, some scriptures as background. So if you have a Bible, turn with me please to uh, three passages in the epistle to the Philippians. The first is Philippians 1 beginning with verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And then in the second chapter, starting with verse 19, but I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also shall be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all and was distressed because he heard you heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, in order that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Therefore receive him in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. And then in chapter 4, verses 20 through 23. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. And the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There's nothing new about networking. It just takes different forms and different shapes through the years. And I want to talk to you this evening about three eras in the history of the Christian church where networking has been particularly effective uh, in the advance of the gospel. And you notice the title of my subject is Christian Networking in the Advance of the Kingdom of Christ. And those three eras are, first of all, the middle part of the first century. The second is in the middle, late middle part of the 16th century in Europe. And the third is uh, from the uh, late middle 20th century to the early 21st century. And in those three eras, I want to show three things. I want to show from the first era that the model for Christian networking in the advance of the kingdom of God is the churches of the New Testament. Second, I want to give you a phenomenal uh, story about networking for three generations in Europe. 
And then I want to conclude by talking about uh, the acceleration of Christian networking in the advance of the kingdom of God in the late middle 20th century through the early 21st century. So first of all, let's go back a couple thousand years. Uh, there were, the more I teach the epistles of the New Testament, the more amazed I am at the networking that was going on uh, these people weren't doing networking as individuals isolated from each other and everybody doing his or her own thing. But this networking was going on was inside local churches and between local churches around the Roman Empire. You know, most of Paul's epistles end with, he says, give, give greetings to so and so and so and so and so and so. And studying those names is a great study. I mean, there are Greek names, there are Roman names, there are uh, Middle Eastern names. They come from every background, every uh, race, nationality, language you can imagine. And uh, if you compare these lists of names at the end of Paul's epistles, you'll find that many of them overlap, that these people knew each other. They didn't have cell phones, they didn't have cars, they didn't have airplanes. Getting around the Roman Empire wasn't the easiest thing in all the world. But they kept up with each other. People in Turkey kept up with people in Macedonia. People in Rome kept up with people at Ephesus. They were very familiar with, it, with each other. And what was going on in these churches? They uh, prayed for each other. They visited each other. You have all kinds of stories, and I don't have the time to talk about them, but you have all kinds of stories in Paul's. You can piece together little pieces, and you see that these people traveled hundreds of miles just to visit each other and to encourage each other and to find out what's going on in each other's church. They weren't locked in just to their own little isolated situation, but they understood they were a universal church. They understood that they were a church of churches, all over the world that loved the Lord Jesus Christ. They prayed for each other. Now this is the model, the things I'm telling you now. We have all kinds of uh, uh, prayers in the New Testament of Paul praying for various churches and specific in what he prayed for in these churches. We see Paul asking people to pray for him. We see Paul asking other people to pray for each other. The prayer was an important part of this networking of holding up each other before the throne of God. These people in, their, in the apostolic church invested their lives in each other. Remember Epaphroditus? He said he got sick because you, he, he said, uh, it says in the, for, uh, the, in the second chapter of Philippians, it says that he was distressed when he, uh, you heard that he was sick. That it caused him great pain when the Philippian church thought he was sick. And he almost laid down his life in the cause of Christ and the encouragement of his brothers and sisters in each other. Investment of your life in each other. Why, why do you do it? You don't do it just for money and, and networking, you don't, although that's a good reason to do it, but that's not the main reason. You don't uh, in, uh, do networking, get a wife or a husband, although that's a very good reason to do it that you invest yourself in the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ so that you might be an encouragement to the whole body of Christ. Amen. These uh, churches also invested their money, their finances in each other. They knew when other churches had need and so they would collect an offering from the various churches and raise money. Somebody had a particular problem. Somebody was in deep financial situation. The mission of the work of the Lord needed a financial assistance. They would go together and pool their money and not just spend their money on for themselves. Of course, one of the greatest examples of that is the Christians in Jerusalem. The Christians in Jerusalem got some insider information about real estate in Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And so they sold all their property and uh, shared 
the, whatever money they had in common. Well, communism never works, whether it's voluntary or whatever it is. And so as a result, you read letter after letter from Paul when he's going around raising money for these poverty-stricken Christians in Jerusalem. And people would give money to them and support them. That in Christian network, it's not just something on the Internet. It's a very personal, very spiritual thing of you investing your life and your energy and your well-being, investing yourself to the point that you might be risking your own health to help each other grow in grace and be effective in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these uh, networkers in the first century also understood something about building buildings. They understood that if you're going to build a building, there's two things you have to keep in view. The necessity for a strong foundation and the ultimate purpose of the building. And if you don't have an idea of what the building's going to look like and what the purpose of this building's going to be, the building will be worth nothing. And of course, if it's not built upon the foundation that's firm and solid, the whole building will be, be uh, come crushing down. So these New Testament Christians realized, or to put it in modern language, they realized we can't take our model for how we relate to each other and serve each other from the world. You can't look out here at successful networks and say, well, that's what I want. I'm going to do that. I'm going to imitate that. That a Christian is never neutral about anything. He can't be. That the Word of God applies to everything in life. It's divinely authoritative in everything about which it speaks, and it speaks about everything. Jesus Christ is the Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. Every aspect of life is under His kingship. And so when it comes to networking and getting together to form businesses or social relationships or whatever it is we're net networking for, we have to understand that everything about it is to be based upon the Word of the living God. The churches of the New Testament are often uh, they often talk about unity in the truth. And Paul particularly praised the Thessalonian church for its unity in the truth. They understood that. They understood a very simple truth, and that is the more two Christians believe the same thing together, the deeper and richer and more lasting their relationship will be. Now, you and I as Christians will have fellowship with Christians of any stripe that love the Lord Jesus Christ and believe His Word. We may differ with them on all kinds of various other things in the life of the church, but we can have fellowship with anybody that loves Jesus Christ, rests upon Him alone for salvation, and loves His Word. But the more we are united in the truth, the more unity we share in believing the revealed truths of Scripture, the deeper our unity can become. And a, a, the, the more affection we will have for each other. These Christians, the, their affection for each other just oozes in the epistles of the New Testament. Paul concludes several of his books with greet each, greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, he, he's not trying to invent some liturgical moment in a worship service where you kiss the bishop's ring. He's simply saying, to put it in modern lingo, give everybody a kiss for me. Give everybody a hug for me. That's how much I love you all. That's how much I, want, I, I feel a part of you, even though we're, we're distance away from each other that there was a strong affection for each other because there was a common affection and love for and unity in the truth as it is in Jesus. Now we come from all kinds of different churches to here today. I preached one time in a Southern Baptist church and uh, I got up and I said, Brothers, it's a real blessing for this Presbyterian to preach in this Baptist church because it just shows you that the important thing is not what denomination you're a member of, 
or whether or not you love the Lord. And all the brothers said, Amen, Amen, Amen. And I said, Well, if I take a chance, you can be Presbyterian. <laughs> I didn't know the old preacher was sitting back in the auditorium. And so he stood up and he said, Brother Moorcraft, I'll come over if you come under. <laughs> so we come from all kinds of different denominations. And there are differences. But on the main strokes of the Christian religion, there must be unity. And without unity, there'll not be any solid ground on which to, to build lasting networks that advance God's kingdom. God's kingdom advances through the truth and not through misrepresentations of the truth. And I can't urge you enough to take the early church, uh, apostolic church as your model. And make sure in your church the foundation is solid and everything that's preached in your church and taught is in strict accordance with the Word of God. You've got to know about a strong foundation and lay that foundation well for a networking that's going to last. Then there is a second era. Oh, oh there were one other thing about the apostolic church. They kept up with each other through correspondence. We have uh, some idea in the New Testament that there were letters written back and forth that weren't inspired of the Holy Spirit, but that they were, that's the way they kept up with each other. And you know the difference between an epistle and a letter. Now we can be real casual and we can talk about the letters of Paul, but basically we're not being exactly accurate when we say that. Because these were epistles, and there's a difference between letters and epistles. A letter is addressed to a, particularly per, a particular person, and the intent of that letter is for that person to read it. An epistle is a, a, a addressed to a particular person or group with the intention that it'll be read by more people than just the person addressed. So on a couple occasions, he ends his epistles by saying, uh, read this epistle in the church. Now, the great implication of that is, first of all, Paul would not tell him to read anything in church that wasn't the Word of God. So here you have an apostle thinking of his own epistles as being a part of the Holy Spirit-inspired scriptures. But the point is, they communicated with each other. They corresponded. They knew what was going on in each other's lives, and that's the the great thing of something like this, where we not only hear talks, but we get to meet each other and talk to each other about what's going on in our lives. Because we are, after all, part of the same body, the same organization, the same organism, the family of God by grace through faith. And so while you're here, as Brother Bod can emphasize, get to know your brothers and sisters and get to know the people that you're going to be talking to and working with and investing your life and your money in in the future. Now the second era in the history of the church where networking was particularly effective, I, I recommend this book very highly to you. It is not easy reading. It's one of those Cambridge books that cost an arm and a leg. But it's called Brethren in Christ, a Calvinistic network in Reformation Europe by a man named Ole, O-L-E, Peter Grell, G-R-E-L-L. -L. Brethren in Christ, a Calvinistic network in Reformation Europe. I have read, read, read a lot of history books in my life. I didn't read this until two or three years ago, and I learned things I never knew before. In the late middle 16th century, there were several Italian families that had to flee Italy because of persecution by the Roman Catholic Church. These families became some, their descendants became some of the greatest minds and preachers in the history of the church. One of the families' name was Diodati. Diodati was a man that taught at Geneva Academy, the Calvin Institute. Another family was the Turretin family. 
And if you want one of the greatest systematic theologies that I know of that's still being published this day is the systematic theology of Francis Turretin. But the amazing thing about these families is this. They fled Europe, uh, they fled Italy to France, England, uh, Switzerland, Germany, Holland, and over three generations, tens upon tens of thousands of people in these families were all over Europe. And they created what is called by historians a Calvinistic diaspora. You know the Jewish diaspora where the Jews were spread all over the world? Well, this is a Calvinistic diaspora, people who were children of the Protestant Reformation. They didn't believe the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. These people believed that salvation was by grace through faith in Christ alone. They believed the Bible was the all-sufficient Word of God. And so as they fled Italy, they settled in in various other countries. And they intermarried. And they planted churches together. And many of the, the fathers and the sons, the grandsons, became elders in those churches. They started businesses in every nation in which they fled, to which they fled. They started banks, which were some of the biggest banks in Europe owned by reform people. And th through these banks and businesses, they used their money and their resources to sponsor the spread of the gospel in other areas. So in my opinion, the Reformation would not have gotten as far as it went all over northern Europe if it wasn't for these families that developed a network that covered all of northern Europe. And so the reason that I think the Reformation spread was because of the preaching of the Word of God and this Calvinistic network that originated with a few migrant Italian families for three generations. They carried on this network. And every culture in which they went benefited from the networks that they created. Why do I say three generations? Because it didn't last for the fourth generation. You know why? They quit intermarrying each other. And they started marrying people from the cultures in which they settled. You want to destroy the Christian movement one generation? Go find some husband, find some wife that doesn't share the great gospel of the Reformation that you believe. Go find somebody like that. Go find somebody that because you think he's good looking or she's good looking, you're, you're convincing yourself, wow, this person's a great Christian, when in your heart of hearts you know he's not. Marry an unbeliever. One generation ended one of the most effective Christian networks in the history of the Christian church. It is really true. Bad company corrupts good morals. It is really true that we dare not be unequally yoked together, not only in marriage, but in the whole Christian network that we're seeking to build in order to advance the kingdom of God on this earth. You know, the uh, first generation Israelites in Canaan that went with Joshua to invade and conquest Canaan and to occupy it, my opinion is that that first generation under Joshua was the godliest generation in the history of Old Testament Israel. The next generation, the second generation in Canaan, intermarried with the Canaanites. The third generation 
start worshiping Canaanite gods. Not many people like you in this world. It can be all over if you don't understand that you are distinctively different than many of your Christian friends. And you can't intermarry with people just because they profess to be Christian. Find out what they believe. Find out if their heart is committed to Christ. Find out if they believe in the all-sufficiency of the Word of God. Find out if they trust in Christ alone for salvation. Find out if they love God's law and believe God's law applies to every area of life. Find out if they believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Make sure. And don't just fall for some pretty face or some handsome figure. Or oh, it's all over. Third era is uh, from the late middle 20th century through the early 21st century. And I call this period the acceleration of Christian networking in the advance of the kingdom of Christ. It really is amazing. Now, I was born in 1944, and so I had the privilege of seeing what life was like and the churches were like before the late middle 20th century. And then in the late 1960s and after that, I saw things happen in this country that I'd never seen happen in my life before. I saw things happen that I, I hadn't read about in the previous century. By 1960, the church in America had pretty much surrendered. And I'm not talking about the liberals. The liberals are gone. I'm talking about the evangelicals and the reformed churches. By 1960, they pretty much had surrendered and had left the arena and had abandoned any engagement with culture and were influenced by an old Greek philosophy called Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism said that physical, worldly, material things are base and lowly and the only thing that is good is the contemplative, the inner, the spiritual, and the heavenly. And that old pagan philosophy wormed its way in to evangelicalism in the early part of the 20th century so that they became, without even knowing it, Neoplatonists, that uh, we shouldn't enjoy making money. That's worldly. That's a distraction. Uh, you have to kiss your wife to carry on the species, but you shouldn't enjoy it. That you should distance yourself as much as you can from the things of this life, like the old monks and nuns of the Middle Ages, who thought that if we can uh, live austere lives and deny basic human passions and drives and enjoyments, we'll get closer to God. It didn't work in the Middle Ages. And it didn't work in the 20th century. What happened to the Christian church, which in the late 19th century or middle 19th century was strong? What happened to it? It surrendered. It abandoned the field. There were so many modernists in the educational institutions, they just gave up and said, well, the only important thing anyway is trying to save as many people from hell as we can before Jesus comes and burns everything up. And so they withdrew. No more networking to speak of. Nothing significant. Everybody locked into his little church, into his little prayer closet, into his little family, and Christianity didn't get beyond that. And as a result, we lost the American culture. A friend of mine wrote a book called The Stealing of America. And I told him after he wrote his book, I said, you've misnamed it. It's a great book, but you've misnamed it. They didn't steal it from us. We gave it to them. We surrendered. When we came into the 20th century, we left the universal lordship of Christ in the 19th. We left the sovereignty of God's grace in the 19th century. We left the universal application of, the, of biblical law into the, in the last century. 
we left the basic elements that shaped Christianity in this country from, from uh, Plymouth throughout the 19th century. We left it in the last century. And we started compromising with the culture in which we are. And now we're on the run. You know who the real perverts in America are today? You know that disgusting feeling that you have and I have when you see a homosexual that is proud that he's homosexual and is blatantly, arrogantly homosexual? You know that disgust that you have when you see him? That's the way our culture sees you. That's what it feels about you. You and I are the real perverts in the American culture. And don't blame the Democrats. Don't blame the Republicans. Over the first three quarters of the 20th century, we surrendered. And here's what we have. But beginning in the middle and late 1960s, things start happening, things start changing, and the Reform faith, now you know what I mean by the Reform faith? The Reform faith is that worldview and that way of life and that way of believing that is rooted in the 16th century Protestant Reformation, which was rooted in the Old Testament, the New Testament. John Calvin, John Knox, Martin Luther, all those great guys, they didn't think all these things up. That's why the word Calvinist is not the greatest word in the world. They simply uncovered what had been hidden for the previous thousand years. What the church had covered up, they unco uh, the Roman church, they uncovered and took the church back to its roots in the New Testament. The churches of the New Testament. The truths of the New Testament and the Old Testament. And the Reformed faith spread, the dis distinctively Reformed, not just sort of, kind of, a little bit, but relentlessly Reformed religion became the fastest growing movement in the last quarter of the 20th century. And it has a great deal to do with networking. More churches of our stripe were planted in the last quarter of the 20th century, in the early 21st century, than any time I'd read about in the previous 20th century. They were small, they still are small, but that's okay. Some of them will die out. Some of them will sell out. But some of them will grow and there will be churches for generations where you and your children and your grandchildren can grow up serving each other and hearing the pure doctrine of the Word of God. These churches that started in the uh, late 20th century, you, you're members of some of them. There were conferences like this in the late 20th century. Prior to the late 1960, there weren't con con uh, conferences like this. But in the late 20th century, there were all kinds of conferences, and hundreds of people went to these conferences from all over the place. Not just to hear a half-baked gospel or a man-centered gospel, but the pure religion from the Word of God uncovered by the Protestant Reformation. Uh, booksellers printing companies were created during those times. Discount book services, uh, audio tape rental libraries. There was a man that I knew in, uh, in Mississippi, Mount Olivet, Mount Olive, Mississippi, Bassville, Mississippi, and it's called the Mount Olive Tape Library, and the man's name was George Calhoun, and he was a mailman. And he always wore gray suits, had a gray beard and gray hair, shades of Robert E. Lee. And he had a tape library of hundreds of thousands of tapes by great Reformed preachers from the whole English-speaking world. And he would rent these for two weeks to anybody that would pay 25 cents a tape. They couldn't buy it, they had to rent them. And during his lifetime, he developed a network 
of people through those tapes that by God's grace he used to change their mind and change their lives and they're still preaching the gospel today. And the churches are still reading reformed books and they're still trying to spread the gospel to other people because of this vast network this mailman started by renting audio tapes for 25 cents apiece. Publishing houses. Uh, Discount book services. Um, I'll tell you some things that I know personally about my own life and ministry of networking with people, and that is in the pro-life movement. If you're not involved in uh, abolishing abortion, something's wrong with you. I don't even know if I'd call myself a Christian. And uh, so in pro-life movement, Christians got together in our church, for instance, with other churches like ours. We started a home for unwed mothers. We built a home for unwed mothers. And in that home for unwed mothers, we would teach these young mothers a trade. Because abortion usually comes down to financial decisions. And we teach these young mothers a trade so that they would learn how to make a living and take care of their own children. If they didn't have these uh, women with unwanted pregnancies, if they didn't have money to uh, to deliver the child, Many of the Christians in our community would raise money and pay for the delivery of the child. If they didn't want the child, many of the Christians in our community would network together and they would adopt the child saved from abortion. They would fight for life in the uh, capital, state legislature, so that we in Atlanta have had marches around January the 22nd, uh, Roe versus Wade decision, 1973, that have often numbered into the thousands of these Christians uniting themselves to speak for human life, unborn life. Uh, The the pro-life movement in the early days in Georgia was not that effective because it was not willing to be that biblical Oh, by the way, when am I supposed to stop? You know, my favorite verse in the New Testament is, and Paul went on till midnight. (laughs) So, so how much more time do I have? Okay, 30? Is that what you said? (laughs) I got a feeling it's less than that. Okay, and... uh, (laughs) Uh, the pro-life was, movement was not very effective in Georgia in the early days because it wasn't willing to be biblical. It wasn't willing to call abortion murder. And so the Georgia Right to Life organization just sort of dwindled into nothing of any importance whatsoever. Until Christians got together and said, we've got to salvage this. Yes. So Christians got together and networked and took over Georgia Right to Life. And now it's the strongest state right to life organization in the United States because it is not afraid to be completely and explicitly Christian in the networking of Christians for human life. I also remember when several of us started a a clothing store You walked into it, it looked like a clothing store. And it was for people who couldn't afford to go to clothing stores. But people would dedicate their clothes, shoes, suits, shirts, dresses. This is what happens when you can network with other people. Uh, In our church, we had a thing called, uh, oh, I knew I was going to forget this, Time, Tool, and Talent. File. This is easy for you to do. Time, tool, and talent. That is, we would uh, interview all the various people in the congregation, and we'd find out what they had that they're willing to use in the life of somebody else. Somebody has more time than somebody else, so 
we say, this guy's got plenty of time on such and such a date. Other people had tools that other people didn't have, chainsaw, whatever. Are you willing to loan that out to a member? Yeah. Talent, some of you are very talented. You can do things that other people can't do. So we'd keep a file of time, tool, and talent and developed a network so that the Christians could take each help each other and not be slaves of the state anymore. We also had a uh, fund called the Needy Family Fund. And it was a fund that anybody, anywhere, any Christian could contribute to. And it was not uh, a part of the budget. It was something over and above the budget where people would give their money and it was given to help people that were in financial, material, social, physical need. If somebody was in a situation where he was desperate financially, hospital bills, some unexpected indebtedness, something to that effect, they could come to our deacons and they could say, could I borrow X amount of money from your needy family fund? And so they would counsel the person to see if there's anything in his life that needed to be changed so that he wouldn't get in this situation again. And then they would give him an in, a, a non-interest bearing loan. And they would say, they would agree together, the deacons of this man, do you promise to have this loan paid off by some date. If so, we will loan you this money without interest and you pay it back. And that way he was delivered from his particular embarrassment, didn't become a further slave to debt, and the, the, the fund was continually replenished, not only by the gifts of Christians, but by these people paying their debts back. These are just some of the ways. There are all kinds of ways in the late 20th century, early 21st century, that I saw people involved in building a network of Christians uh, that had the same faith, the same worldview, the same understanding of Scripture, that held them together during the rough times, and gave them a deep affection for each other. Now one thing to bear in mind that you learn from the Apostolic Church's network, there will be betrayals. There will be defections. There will be disappointments. The Christian church is not perfect. Christian networking is not perfect. People will let you down. Get your Bible dictionary of concordance and look up a man named Demas in the New Testament. Paul, on a couple occasions, when he's giving his greetings to people, says, I'm also sending you greetings from my friend Demas. But then there's one last greeting. And in that greeting, Paul says, Demas has left me. He loved the world more than he loved the gospel. Will any of you be defective? Will any of you all sell out somewhere along the way? You know, it's not how well you start. It's crossing the finish line that wins the race. I, uh, years ago when I was in high school in Texas, was in the state finals in, the, uh, uh, in a particular race, the high hurdles. Now high hurdles, you know what, about that high? And there's five or six or seven of them down the track. And you've got to stride over all these hurdles and cross the finish line. And you've got to get the same number of steps between the hurdles if this is going to work. And you've got to cross each hurdle with the same leg and the opposite arm. Well, I was in the starting blocks, 
And the gun went off, and I got the best start I've ever gotten in my life. I mean, I was out of those starting blocks before anybody else was. And I was crossing, jumping that first hurdle when most people were getting out of the starting blocks. And I jumped the second hurdle when everybody else was jumping the first. I was jumping the third when they were jumping the second and on. One more hurdle left and then the goal line. And some way or another, I didn't pay attention. And I got my stride mixed up, and I straddled that last hurdle. And I broke it into dozens of pieces. And I saw everybody pass me, and I never even made it to the finish line. It's not how well you start. It's crossing the finish line that wins a race. You're excited now. This is a refreshing thing. This is something you're praying for, something you've wanted, something you wish was in your own church. I've seen people like that that are gone. It takes perseverance, perseverance, perseverance. Don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due time you shall persevere if you do not faint. One time when my boys, who are now in their 40s, were little boys, they wanted me to make them a kite and fly a kite in August in Georgia <laughs> on five acres where all the pine trees were taller than this building. And there hadn't been a gust of wind get between those pine trees since Sherman burned Atlanta. <laughs> but I didn't want to disappoint my boys. So I got a kite, made a kite, put a string on it, tail. There was only one clear place on my property where you could fly a kite, and it was like this. And it was a gravel road, and it was 100 degrees. And I ran up and down that gravel road, trying to satisfy my little boys and getting that flight for that kite 15 feet in the air. And my sons were encouraging me, they thought, they paid attention to their daddy's sermons. And the whole time I was about to have a streak heat stroke, they kept crying out, persevere, daddy, persevere. <laughs> well, that's my counsel to you. It's going to get hot. I believe the generation that comes after us is going to experience more severe persecution from the state and society than anything we've ever experienced. But you... Don't grow weary in well-doing. It doesn't say. Don't grow weary in well-doing because you just might make it if you're lucky, but I doubt it. It says, don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due time you shall reap if you do not faint. Now, one last thing. I said a while ago, you not only... If you're going to build a building, you must keep in mind a strong foundation. And the second thing is you must keep in mind the vision of what that building is going to look like and the purpose that it's going to serve. And that's why I entitled my talk tonight, A Christian Network for Advancing the Kingdom of Christ. There are all kinds of secondary and tertiary goals for social networking, business networking, and all the rest. Creating something that is a good service to a community that you can make a profit from selling. Uh, new friends, girlfriend, boyfriend, all those things are important. But keep in mind what the ultimate purpose of this building of Christian networking is. It is the rebuilding of Christian civilization. Do you know that the middle, medieval Christians understood something about the gospel that we have forgotten? When we, for the, particularly the early part of the 20th century, would talk about the purpose of the church and the role of the church, we'd talk about, as I said a while ago, learning to play a guitar and save a few people from hell and 
He'll, uh, before Jesus comes and burns everything up. And that's, that's all we knew. And then we forgot what the Great Commission was. Jesus said in Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and make disciples of the nations. He did not say, Go ye therefore and make disciples of solitary, detached, unrelated individuals here and there among the nations. Now that's important. Sharing the gospel of Christ with individuals is a part of our task. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said as he was ascending to the right hand of God to his apostles who were there on the Mount of Ascension. And in speaking to the apostles, he was speaking to the foundation of the church. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians? He said the foundation of the church is the apostles and the prophets, Christ being the chief cornerstone. So in addressing them, he's addressing us. And he's saying, I have a goal for you. And in all your networking, in all of your connections, in all of your working for, uh, together, in all of your investing yourselves in each other's lives. Remember that your responsibility is to bring the discipline of the Word of God to bear upon the nations themselves. Not just upon individuals within those nations but to bring the authority and the power and the meaning of the Word of God to bear upon the nations themselves and their society and culture and institutions. And don't rest until you have seen how that Word has changed not only men, but whole cultures. There is a phrase that we use, and it's a good phrase, as long as you use other phrases with it. We speak of Jesus as being our personal Savior. Now, Jesus is my personal Savior. But Jesus is far more than a personal Savior. Jesus is a cosmic Savior. Jesus came to destroy the effects of sin, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found. And so you and I are called to be, in all our networking, civilization builders. And that's what Christians in the Middle Ages knew that we have forgotten. They tried for a thousand years. They didn't do it well. I don't recommend medieval church as a model, but they tried for a thousand years. The church failed them. They tried to rebuild civilization based upon the kingship of Christ and the authority of Christ's word. They didn't do it well. But they understood for a thousand years that the call was to be builders of civilization. And as long as we have forgotten that and just focus on spiritual involvement, going to heaven when we die, as great as those are, we will continue to abandon our cultures and our societies, and that's what will leave our children and grandchildren, abandoned cultures. You and I are to be civilization builders. When uh, our founding fathers came over here, when the pilgrims came to 16, in 1620 to Plymouth, what do you think they came over to North America to do? To sit on top of a mountain and learn to play a lyre and wait for Jesus to come? They came over here to build a Christian civilization, to lead the Indians to Christ, to build homes and businesses and churches and schools and all the rest based upon the principle of the historic Christian faith. Adam and Eve your great-great-great-grandparents. What was their goal in life? To take the resources of Eden and to subdue the earth and to fill it and exercise dominion over it. Genesis 1, you know. In other words, God called them to create civilizations based upon His Word down through their generations. They failed. 
Now you and I have been renewed in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now God is making, has made us to be by His Spirit what He made Adam and Eve to be. That is prophets, priests, and kings. Prophetesses, priestesses, and queens. What does a prophet do? He interprets every area of life by the Word of God. What does a priest do? He dedicates every area of life to the living God. What does a king do? He rules himself and everything he has any authority over in terms of the law and the Word of God. So you see, our calling is far bigger than most Christians in the 20th century think. And if you're going to have a network that's worth talking about, and not just a little network that makes you a little money and gets you a pretty girl. If that's all you want, well, do whatever you got to do. But don't call it Christian. Now, I'm calling upon you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of you who claim to be Christians, quit the compromise, quit the negotiation with this world. Uh, uh, separate yourself from the mores and standards and goals and illusions and seductions of this world and surrender everything you are and everything you have to the Lord Jesus Christ and get to know other Christians like that and then work together to bring this, this world and lay it at the feet of the Lord Jesus and to bring the discipline of the Word of God upon the nations themselves. It has been done. It will happen time after time until that day when the knowledge of the Lord covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Thank you. I need help getting down.